Grab the Bible that you have. Grab that Bible and turn to Romans chapter 2 this morning. Romans chapter 2. And we're looking at a message, and I promise, <laughs> I promise you, this, part two of this message today will not be traumatic. It's not going to cause you nightmares, gentlemen. Uh, if you were here last week, weren't, you weren't here last week? Five of you were? Uh, we, we're talking about, well, we'll read it in a moment, but we're going to finish it off, the verses 28 and 29 specifically. But uh, when enough is not enough is what we're looking at. And I will read the odd-numbered verses, if you'll read out loud, the even-numbered verses. Romans chapter 2, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Verse 29, we'll end here. But he is a Jew, says Paul who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, or that is the law, whose praise is not from men, but from God. This is deep stuff. Father, we pray that you'd give us an understanding of your word. We ask you, Lord, to give us the ability to be students, not just to take it in, but to do it. And this is hard for us, Lord, we confess, because this goes against our human nature to live so free in Jesus seems almost unlawful to be so liberated by the Holy Spirit's possession of us seems as though we must impose rules upon ourselves. Dear God in heaven, we're asking you as a church, as a people, to cause us to know the deep things of God and to live them, that we might be examples to all that we meet, Jew and Gentile alike. So Father, we commit this time to you. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. When enough is not enough, Paul the Apostle, as you just saw and heard a moment ago, is speaking to the believers that are in Rome proper and to the fellowships that had emanated out from the fellowship of Rome, where these believers predominantly, as we've been announcing at that time, first century era, remember this, the church was born in Jerusalem. We forget that. The church was predominantly Jewish in its lineage or its heritage. It was the fact that the Jews got saved, we would say, and born again, Jesus put it. And this is fundamental. Listen today, because you can go on all kinds of websites about what Jews and Christians believe, and you're going to listen to what all of these rabbis have to say, and it just blows my mind, people, because nothing's changed in 2,000 years. God, of all time and eternity, revealed himself to the Jewish people. That's his choice. That's what he chose to do. And he selected them to be the bearers of the gospel. And that's why the Messiah came to Israel. That's why he had to be born in Bethlehem. God could have written the Bible and he could have said that God was going to arrive. Let's be honest. He could have written the scripture announcing in the Old Testament that it would, it would be a place someday where the Messiah would arrive called Toronto. 
or San Diego. He could have written it that way, couldn't he? And he could have said that Californians are my chosen people. It's irrelevant, but for the choosing. Why would God do this? Because God says, I picked the Jewish people to be a people, to be my witness, saith the Lord. That's Isaiah 43. And that they were to go out to all the world and they were proclaim God's truth. In other words, can I put it really uh, bluntly? Uh, God is saying in the Old Testament and in the opening throes of the New Testament that I have called my people Israel whose very existence is a living parable from the moment I called Abraham. It's It's a living story for all to read. It's so... What's the word? It's so encompassing as to who's invited. I've been stressing over and over again. Do you guys remember? Abraham, because you know the Jews will say, Abraham, Abraham. It's all about Abraham. It is all about Abraham. I, I listened to a rabbi, just for punishment, I listened to a rabbi <laughs> on, on Friday, and the, and the rabbi was saying how, you know, this whole thing about Jesus and coming to faith that that you can be justified by faith, he said, is an abuse of scripture. It's made up by Paul the apostle and it's heresy. And I'm yelling at my TV screen. He couldn't hear me, but I'm saying it wasn't Paul's idea. God spoke that through Habakkuk, the Hebrew prophet in chapter two, verse four, that the just shall live by faith. That Abraham was declared righteous before he was ever circumcised. Abraham Abraham was declared righteous before there was ever a Ten Commandments, before Moses was born. Think of that. So here's this rabbi saying what they said 2,000 years ago. Nothing's changed because, listen, when you don't accept Christ, you're still stuck in your religion. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Are you stuck in religion or do you actually know God? And this offends people. God, I believe God exists, but you talk about how we could actually know him. If God exists, and he does, I'm just being sarcastic. Could he, would he not make himself knowable? What kind of a God would, a, would create us to know one another, but then he, was, he refuses to be known himself. You can't, if you have that view, you got to divorce yourself from that view right now because there's one word I'm going to give you that demolishes your idea on that or your wor- worldview on that. And the one word is Bible. Bible. God gave the Bible. And the Bible is his message to all of mankind. And in a nutshell, it goes like this, everybody. I, God, picked the Jews. This is what it says in Deuteronomy. I picked them to tell the world about me. And I picked them because they're the most stubborn people on the planet. It's all about God's miraculous work. Think of that. I I tell them to go right, they go left. I tell them to stand up, they sit down. I give them the answer, they argue. And God said, I picked them for a purpose. He loves them. But he gave them his gospel, the good news. It's fulfilled in the New Testament, but it's promised in the Old. The gospel is throughout the Old Testament. The good news. What is the good news? That by the keeping of the law, you might be justified before God? No. No. But that, listen, by faith in God, you'll be justified. And so Paul has been arguing this and with graphic and with power. Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse said, I'm so grateful regarding this portion of Romans chapter 2 because... Paul speaks it clearly, and he said, much of the world understands it clearly. He said, until we come to Europe and North America, because we, he said, we have been polluted by the Victorian Puritan approach to Romans chapter 2, and it's true. Prior to about 1940-ish, 50-ish, 
uh, Bible scholars would never, they would just kind of skip over Romans 2. Why? Because it mentions the word circumcision. <laughs> Everybody else in the world discusses Romans 2 except the Victorian Puritan world. Why? Because you can't mention circumcision without thinking about something else. <laughs> and that's, that's unacceptable, so we won't talk about it. And that's unfortunate because it's the, it's the exact and direct argument that the Jew believed that he was acceptable to God by his outward circumcision. And listen, he could live and would choose to live any kind of life he wanted to, but he would argue himself to be thinking, I keep the law, I'm acceptable, but if I don't, it's okay because I've got insurance. And my insurance, my fire insurance against hell, which today now many Jews don't even believe that the Bible teaches that, my insurance is that I've been circumcised. And so if at, at any time there's any doubt, you can announce that you've been circumcised. And Paul is saying, you're deceived. And you see, that's why a lot of Jews, if you, if you Google Paul the Apostle, you're going to see the hate mail that he still gets today from bloggers very, very powerful. Listen, I, I ask you to write these verses down if you would as we, as we get into the last argument. It's in verses 28 to 29, and I'll warn you up front, it's going to be a little bit before we get there, but it's, it's, I think it's worth the trip. Um, regarding this fact about when enough is not enough, and at what point... Um, the whole thing about us having physical things to fulfill uh, uh, appeals to the flesh. Do you understand that? Uh, this is, listen, I don't mean to insult or hurt anybody, but please follow this through. Remember, for the last few weeks, I've been saying things like, just give me the rules, pastor. Give me the rules, priest. Give me the rules, evangelist or pope. Just give me the rules and I'll keep them. I'll do my best to keep them. Just give me the rules so I know what, what to do. God's not into that. But we embark upon our quest to prove our own self-righteousness. And then when we fail, then we go to the priest, the, the whoever, and we say, now I messed up, so tell me what to do to get fixed so I can start again. We looked at that last week. It takes no faith to have that kind of a life. Do you understand? Because listen, let's be honest. If we live our lives where it's connected to a person, in other words, a religious authority, if you somehow think, well, I, I'm okay with God because uh, I, I go to Calvary, you're in trouble. If you say, I'm okay, I, I'll be all right, I, I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Lutheran, or I'm a, are you, are you with me? Anything that breeds that is dangerous. It, it's, it's, it's religion, not relationship. And so I know many are, are here from various churches and you've gone through all kinds of dynamics. Let me tell you something right up front, right here, right now. Always keep your eyes six feet and above, as my good friend tells me. Keep your eyes on Jesus, always Jesus. Because... When we begin to attach ourselves to physical acts and performances and rules and regulations, there's no faith needed in that. Are you with me? Are you tracking? No faith. It's hard. Will you understand this? And please don't misunderstand me. It is hard to maintain an invisible love for an invisible God like you and I do. We don't see crosses and angels in the sky or in a tortilla shell. <laughs> we don't go to see someone to qualify our faith. You and I as believers, we're followers of Jesus. We believe in a God that we've never seen. And I think I speak for most. There's exceptions, but physically have never heard. Some people say they've heard him speak. That's amazing. I don't know what that's like. But there's, a, there's one thing that all of us have in common, and that is inside of us, internally, there is a witness 
that we cannot deny. That God has spoken to us on the inside. And here's the awesome thing about this. Is the fact that every one of us together on this journey with Jesus. And it is real. It's so real it cannot be denied. Uh, people can upset us and, and hurt us. And, and cause us to uh, be tempted to be disillusioned by the authority or whatever it is. Not Jesus. Never. (laughs) But that love, which is invisible, is so powerful in our lives that it it captivates us and it controls us. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Jesus said to this church, his precious church in Ephesus, that's Turkey today, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love Speaking to believers, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Fall in love with God all over again. God doesn't care about your outward circumcision, and he doesn't care about your outward profession of what group you're related to. God says, I want to have a relationship with your heart. And he speaks to the church at Ephesus, and he says, I can tell that you've left your first love. Oh, and by the way, when you go study that church, they left their first love by being too busy. Go read it. Watch out. I'm saying that to me. You watch out for you. I'm talking about myself. I need to watch out. It's, listen, invisible love. You got to work at maintaining it. But Jesus says, watch out because you can leave your first love and you need to go back to that. Romans chapter nine, verse six. Romans nine, six says, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Why? What's he saying? Love. Do you love God? Not by conversation, not by whoever you might be with. Do you love God in the invisible? 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. These are all introductory verses. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, John's writing to believers It is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. I love that. He's not messing around. It's not the last days. John's saying, it's the last hour. (laughs) They went out from us. Notice one of the indicators of the last days, and that as time expires. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest or known that some of them, that none of them, excuse me, were of us. What's going on? Every situation and time, our love is being tested. And with all that's going on in life and all the shaking that's taking taking in our world, our love's being tested, is it not? Some of you have come to, some of you have fallen in love with Jesus since the COVID crisis, for example, or other things. You've come to know Jesus. Others have left, drifted away. I'm not saying left this building. I'm saying left off from faith. Maintaining an invisible love has nothing to do with your external fleshly conduct, nor, as Paul would say, circumcision. It's a tremendously powerful argument that he's making. And so church, look, by way of review, number one, we saw that when we're asking the question regarding how do we get acceptable before God when enough is not enough, we asked the question, how much is needed? And we looked at verse 25, and he's talking about circumcision is profitable. It works only if you keep the law. And immediately, everyone should have thrown their hands up in frustration, right? Right? So how much is needed? The answer is, you ain't got it. You don't have enough to provide what's needed to be acceptable to God by your good works, by even the keeping of the law, which is a fallacy because the law is given, as we saw, to show you that you cannot get to heaven by being good enough. The law is that black and white unit with the red light on top. The law is that sign that says, stop. Or the law is that sign that says yield or whatever it might be. It's a posted law. 
but you'll never find a sign posted in the Bible. Do this and you'll be saved. All of it, and I say all of it by singular, all of it leading to one thing. Put your faith in Christ and in him alone. And salvation is accomplished. The just shall live by faith. And then we saw last time, verses 26 to 27, we asked the question, how does that happen? So how does it happen? And as scripture there says, therefore, if an uncircumcised man, this is a Gentile, keeps the righteous requirements of the law. Now, this ought to get your attention. You say, Jack, you just said you can't keep it. But the Bible says here you can keep it. Hang on. Will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Immediately, it takes us to the heart. He's not talking about the Gentile who keeps the law by never sinning. That's impossible. But he's talking about a person who's not circumcised, but who loves God, is pursuing God, and lives for God. And God says, Paul is saying, does not God look at that man's heart and say, that's a circumcised individual? Do you see that? If there's any filler whereby you say, I'm going to heaven because, and it's not by the merits of Jesus Christ and him alone, you got a problem. And all that works into the maintaining of an invisible love that so controls us. And so here we are, this is where we end today, verses 28 to 29, when enough is not enough, how can I experience this for myself? And we see this in verse 28. We see this, church, and mark it down, please. You want to experience this liberty and freedom? Yes. Write this down. Stop with the scorecard. Stop with the self-imposed religion that you and I have the tendency to put upon ourselves. Satan will seek to do that even in the believer's life. He will seek to impose upon you the embracing of you doing things, saying things, giving things, whatever it might be, and you have this invisible scorecard, this, this thing in your head, this tally, this spreadsheet that's keeping record. And we want to watch out for that. Look at verse 28. This is shocking. And this is why, are you guys with me? Yes. You guys, this is why I'm, verses 28 and 29 drive our Jewish friends crazy. If a Gentile was saying it, it would not make a blip on the radar. But because Paul the apostle says it, who even to this day, no Jew can live up to his Jewishness. He was amazing. He winds up taking all of his personal achievements in his religion and he throws it under the bus where it belongs. And th these two verses shocked the world. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Now you see why? When you've got a bunch of people trusting in that very act, that it is their mark, their seal of salvation. This guy comes along 2,000 years ago and says this. The guy's a lunatic. You'll literally read that there are people today saying, He's, he was touched, he was something went wrong. And yet everything that Paul points out, he's got scripture to back it up. We're not here following Paul. We don't worship Paul. I'm saying this because I know what I'm talking about right now because the Jews will say they worship Paul. No, we don't. Paul was a sinner just like me, just like us, just like you, the critic. No, when he's announcing this, he says something, church, that I just wrote in my own notes to remind myself that for Paul to make this judgment call, the world would say today, many in the church today would say, shame on him. Shame on Paul. Watch. He says, for he is not a Jew. 
Well, who made Paul the, uh, who made him the judge? <laughs> Watch this. This is a big, this is a big deal. It seems like Paul's keeping score. He's not keeping score. He's tearing down the scoreboard. He's destroying the, the whole thing about us equating ourselves to a standard. He makes this announcement. You want to talk about a Jew? And it's amazing because, do you guys remember last week what the word Jew means? The word Jew comes from Judah, from the tribe, from Judah, one of the sons. It means to praise God. It means to be a praiser of the Lord God Almighty. Remember I said, if your name's Judy, it means that your name is a praiser. <laughs> so Paul says, a, a person who's not a worshiper of God cannot claim to be a Jew. But a person who is a worshiper of God in spirit, in reality, because it's internal, is in fact a Jew according to whose standard? Is it according to Paul's standards? No, according to God's standard. Judas was a Jew. Judas even had a name that was rooted in praise. And yet the Bible tells us that Judas missed heaven altogether. Think of it. Are you a praiser? Are you a worshiper? For he is not a Jew. So he makes this incredible judgment call, who is one outwardly. So look at this. The equivalent today for us would be for me to be, watch, so, so unloving, so critical, so mean. What gives him the right? If I were to say to you, I've observed your life, or you're saying it to me. I've observed your life, and I've come to the conclusion, you're not a Christian. In this day and age, I say right now what Paul said 2,000 years ago, and the room goes quiet. Because number one, we have somehow fallen into this world of ours that that's unacceptable to look at someone's life and evaluate them and come to the conclusion you're not a Christian. Now listen, we should be very careful about what I'm saying because we cannot pass that judgment. Right. However, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. And he goes so far to say that there are those whose lives actually, they're not sheep of the fold. They're actually wolves on the attack. And they're in and out of the church. So today, and man, I know this, I, my, my confidence level of this going over is like at one. And it's this. We need to walk away from this message today knowing that God wants all of us who name his name to have a love relationship with him. And when that invisible love affair with God is underway, it manifests that invisible love visibly how we live our lives. You should be able to move into my home today. You should be able to park out in front of my house. You should be able to observe me month in and month out and come to the conclusion you follow God. But we don't think like this anymore. And it's wrong of us because we've made Christianity a Western thing. I've told you before, in the Middle Eastern world, you eat together, you're, you, you're rarely ever alone, everybody's together, you know your neighbors, you know your, everybody's talking, everybody's eating, everybody's living life. It's all public. In the Western world, we've got a private church going on. And I want you to know, God's Bible doesn't know anything about that. That if I were to say today, this person is teaching false doctrine. This person's living a false life. This person is living or doing things that are antithesis to the word of God. And then they claim to be a Christian. I could say they're not a Christian who claims they're Christian unless they're a worshiper of God. And you do know what I'm talking about, right? 
We're not talking about, well, well, I worship God. I go to church and I sing. I'm not talking about singing. Forget singing. A worshiper is eating, breathing, moving, talking, attitude, imagination, passion, right? That honors God. And Paul would say, you, you, who, Gentile, uncircumcised, God attributes to you the purity, the righteousness that cir- circumcision represents. It's clear to God that your heart has been circumcised, that you have salvation. It's remarkable. And there's no, there's no scorekeeping. And I'm going to move off from this, but I have to say this first. Christians, it's time for you to stop beating yourself up for your sin or shortcoming of the day. So tomorrow's Monday, and you start a new day. That's why the Bible says there's new what every morning? (laughs) There's new mercies every morning. Why? Because you need them. And here's the deal. You get up and you live tomorrow, and your desire, the believer's desire, you you judge yourself right now. This is not your desire. The true desire is... I am going to get up today, being Monday, and I'm going to live my life for God. Lord, open up doors of opportunity for me to share. Give me the boldness because I'm just just scared to death. Lord, you just do this thing. You do this thing called Christianity in and through me. Here we go, God, and away we go. And as you fail during the day, you get... 20 minutes after praying the prayer, some guy cuts you off on the freeway and you you say, well, you bum. And then God says, I thought we were going to have a good day today. You're right. Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. That is so wrong. Forgiven. Now move on. Did you hear what I just said? I, with what I just said, it the legalist right now was saying, "Mm, that can't be true. That's too good. That's why it's called the gospel. Listen, because the true circumcision of the heart is a constant living moment, there's no longer uh, keeping a score. When the Holy Spirit says to you, you shouldn't have thought that thought a moment ago. God, you're right. You did see me on the inward side and you do know me and that was so wrong and I hated it. And even while I was thinking the thought, I knew I shouldn't have been thinking it. Lord, will you please forgive me? And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9 that he's faithful to forgive you of your sin. If you live like that, you will live a life that's called Christian. If you do that, you will be called a believer. If you do that, you will know perpetual revival. Because it's an ongoing, moment-by-moment experience, and you're no longer stacking up points against yourself because, listen, I've learned this. Maybe you're the same, but I don't need anyone to tell me how messed up I am or when I have the wrong thought. I am so able to beat myself to a pulp. Thank God for his grace and mercy because I, oh, if you only knew... When I first became a Christian, I was the most disgusting legalist you'd ever meet in your life. I was horrible to be around. So legalistic. And boy, did God whittle me down to show me what I really was. And then you throw yourself upon his mercy and his grace. And that mercy and grace is not a ticket to go sin. See, the unbeliever thinks that. The religious person says, well, that's cool. I'll just keep sinning, asking God to forgive me, and just keep sinning. I can have my cake and eat it too. Heaven and all of this. No, the believer doesn't think like that. No more scorekeeping. In a very deep way, Paul is reminding his Jewish audience that God had commissioned them to spread the gospel to the world. They were to be the ones to share. And by the way, the day is coming when they'll do it again. And we'll talk about that in the not too distant uh, future. But it was his desire. Imagine that. The second thing we see in verse 29 is how can you and I can experience this freedom for ourselves where we're really set free from what is enough 
is that you and I start right now with his grace, the grace of God, the grace of God, an enemy, the sworn enemy of legalism, grace. For example, I mean this with all due respect and with affection, but I mean this directly. One of the most law-abiding and publicly righteous person you will experience in life is a Mormon. Good people, love America, love what's right, uh, clean cut, what's the word, Americana, they are, uh, you know what I mean? You'd want a Mormon for your neighbor. Keep the house nice. Think this, this, there's just this. Now behind all that is a, honestly, please, please, you know, behind that is a brutal world of legalism. It's so hard. And you're told, yes, Jesus died for your sins on the cross. But now that you've come to that realization, this is what you must do to keep your sins forgiven. Oh, it's so heavy. And they will say things like this. Oh, so wait, so, so you're a Christian. Yes, yes. So you're, so you're a gracer. That's the word that they'll, that among themselves, they'll never tell you this at your door. I know a little bit inside stuff. My family used to live in Utah. I did not, they did. They, my brother still does. But the Christian who's, who says something like this, God's grace, God's grace is powerful. God's grace is encouraging. God's grace is ever present. A good Mormon will say, I feel sorry for you because, you know, you're leaning on this grace. You're a gracer. You think that he forgives you like that. You think that God makes it easy for you by going to him like that. And they deny that liberty that's available to them through Jesus Christ. Listen, the one true Jesus Christ. The Jesus of the Bible and Jesus said, even with the Pharisees, you lay burdens upon people's lives who you, Pharisees, you priests, you Sadducees and Pharisees, you don't even bear the load of those things yourself. But you demand that your followers do. Jesus said, how dare you? Wow. Billy Graham said, I can live any kind of life I choose to live as a believer. Listen, I'm going to pause for effect. Billy Graham said, I can live any kind of life I want as a believer. So you think about that for a moment. I can choose to live any life I want to live as a believer. And he said... As a believer, my choice is to live for Christ. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. That's a profound statement. You know what? Augustine said it this way. Love God, do as you please. Does that test you? Come on, let's, come on, be honest. That's heavy. It's like, really? Wait, what? Is that true? That's Augustine, but does the Bible back that up? It does, because listen, it, it drives a wedge right in between all of us instantly. Love God and do as you please. The lost will say, that's cool. I'll do as I please. And I'll just say I love God. Well, then why don't you go get circumcised and keep doing what you please? Same difference. But the believer over here says, love God, do as you please. That's cool. Because if I love God, he's going to put it in my heart. I'm going to agree with God that this is what I want to do. Right. It's that thing that pleases him. Right. Do you see the difference? Yes. Oh my goodness. If this gets through to one heart here today, the freedom that can come to you is that, wait a minute, I am not any longer under a judgment sheet or a scorecard 
that I prayed so long on Monday, not so good on Tuesday, but I'll make it up on Wednesday. I didn't get to my Bible on Monday, but I'll read double extra on Tuesday. Get away from that. It's liberating. How can I, Pastor, by his grace, unmerited favor, ordained by God, given by him, distributed abundantly? There's no, listen, there's no running low on his grace to the believer. And so the question comes down to Am I a Jew inwardly? Am I a worshiper and praiser of the Almighty God of the Bible? In the life I live? That's the question. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. Sealed. I know we've gone over this verse a couple of weeks ago, but I don't know if we unpacked that word seal. Can you look at it? Let's look at it on the screen, you guys. Check this out. You might want to take a picture of this. This is incredible. This is the Greek word. This is what it means. God's word, the believer, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't, um, don't take the Holy Spirit that's in your life as a believer in thought or in deed that's going to wound him. You can wound the Holy Spirit who lives in you. If a believer looks at pornography, that's wounding the Holy Spirit. If somebody lies to their boss or their employee you're, and you're a believer, you're wounding the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing me? Yes. If you cheat on your income tax, that's wounding the Holy Spirit. He know, listen, he's the God of all truth. So watch this. It's the whole, see why? Why is that such a big deal? This is the reason why. Are you guys still with me? You're very quiet. Are you good? Are we all right? Okay, listen, this is why it's a big deal. The word used is to set a seal upon. Mark with a seal. To seal for security from destruction from Satan. To mark by pressing into or upon or by embossing. Stamping or sealing for the purpose of identification. I love this. For the purpose of identification and proof of ownership. To authenticate an individual. Think of it. Uh, some of you, is anybody, UCI, you got a UCI hoodie on. UCI, listen, on him, it's marked UCI. Uh, who's playing today? Are the Rams playing the goats? Who's playing today? <laughs> Sometimes I see jerseys here. It depends on what's going on. Some people, sometime on Sunday, people will wear jerseys. Is this World Series still going on? Yeah. Uh, maybe some, maybe people wear the outfits, the Braves and the Astros. Is that who's doing this? See? Okay. I wouldn't have known that, but I saw YouTube. Uh, Trump was at the game and he was doing this and it made world news. I didn't even know who was playing each other. I don't have time for this. And uh, all over the world, uh, like a billion hits, uh, Trump was at the World Series doing the tomahawk, they call it. And uh, it's all over the world now. Can you imagine? What about, look, I can do this and nobody posts nothing. <laughs> what was he doing? I assume he was saying I'm an Atlanta. Is it Atlanta? Atlanta Brave fan. Okay. Yeah, but that's what it means, right? By doing the tomahawk, I'm saying I'm with the Braves. Right? When you wear the jersey, when you wear the hoodie, you're you with the uh, ant anteaters? UCI? Yeah. Okay. Anteaters? We don't even have anteaters in Orange County, but who thought that up? I don't know. But the Los Angeles Rams, and they put the, get the helmet on and the horns on. Listen, you're marking yourselves identity with a certain theme. The Holy Spirit comes into your life and says, you belong to me. 
and I have marked you. Imagine in the spiritual realm, in the invisible world of the love of God, there's a marking on you. Imagine if we could see that. Now, I could argue that we can, in a way, by how we live and act. But imagine instantly right now, if I could put on like, you know, Hobo Kelly <laughs> glasses, and I see Johnny or whoever that person was, me you know. And imagine if I could look across here and I see the indicator of the Holy Spirit. That's what that word means, to be marked and sealed and embossed upon by the Holy Spirit. Why? For authentication, authenticating the fact that you are owned by God. And, and listen, uh, go ahead and write me about this next statement. I'm not going to answer you. If God says he seals you with his Holy Spirit of ownership for identification... I cannot find one verse in the scriptures, because I've tried, where he unseals you. You can't find it. The question is, make sure you're sealed. Make sure you're a lover of God. Absolutely. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Listen to that. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. Say Amen. Is that awesome? God knows those who are his. I'm comforted by that. You say, well, I don't know if I am. Am I his? Am I, his? Am I not? What am I? Do you want to be? If you want to be his, that's because he put the wanna in you. That's not your wanna. He gave you the wanna. The person is sitting here today or watching right now saying, I don't want to. I'm just being, I'm being made by these Christians bribed me to come here that if I just endured your mouth for 55 minutes, I would get a free breakfast. <laughs> you don't have the wanna. You don't care about the wanna. You don't have the wanna. If someone says, I want to have God in my life, God put the wanna in you. That's from him. God knows those who are his. It's precious. In John 20, 31, the Bible says, These are written that you, might, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Listen, it gets better. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Amen. Wow. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33. By, because of time and length's sake, I'll simply say this. That passage of Scripture says to the Jewish people, I am going to do away with the commandments that was written on stone. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. Are you aware of any commandments that were written in stone? The big 10. God says, I'm going to do away with them someday. Now that sounds like, listen, to a Jew, that sounds like blasphemy. But I'm quoting a Jew. Jeremiah. This is from the Old Testament. And he announces there in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33, I'm going to do away with the law that my children broke in the wilderness and I'm going to have a new covenant with them. Friends, listen. God says to the Jewish people, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And that's the covenant Paul's talking about. It's not a covenant that was determined by outward flesh cut away. It's a covenant that is determined by inward flesh cut away. Where the deadness of your heart's removed and a new heart is put in you. God does that. Do you see where we're at, Christians? Yes. We stand on the shoulders of the Hebrew prophets. Amen. We are the ones who have been grafted in. We'll come eventually to Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 in this millennia. I'm sure we'll make it. <laughs> and, God, and the Bible's going to say, Gentiles, don't you get all uppity about you being better than the Jews because they're not following Christ, you better be careful, he said. It's because of them, you've been grafted into the family of God, so you better not boast. 
And then he says, how much more will the salvation of Israel be when God focuses on the Jew again in the last days? Think of that. Can you imagine? When it, when, listen, when Jews start getting saved, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like having a bunch of Paul the Apostles around. We're going to look like Sunday school kids compared to what God's going to do with the Jewish people. It's coming. Ezekiel 36, 27 says to the Jew, I will put my spirit within you. You say, wait a minute, pastor, that's Christian doctrine. Listen, it's Christian doctrine because it's been adopted from the Old Testament. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. How are the Jews going to be obedient? Same way you are, the believer, the Holy Spirit in you does it. I don't need a road sign. I've got him talking to me. I don't need a 10 rules. He speaks to me constantly. You know God speaks. And listen, I, I, gotta, I gotta go here. Here's the thing is, if you doubt God speaks, stop and pause and think. The next time you do something wrong, ask yourself, is he speaking or not? Mm-hmm. Now the non-Christian, you're hearing crickets. There's nothing there. But the believer, I don't know if God's speaking to me. Well, the next time you do something wrong, take a listen. Yeah. Amen. Isaiah 42, verse 6. I can't tell you how many times I've used this on some of my dear friends who do not yet know Jesus as Messiah. Isaiah 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Do you hear this? Just this week, this weekend, in studying for this message, obviously I came across this verse. I took that verse and I sent it to a Jewish friend of mine and I simply said, Shabbat Shalom. As I was studying for Sunday's message, I came across one of your passages of scripture from one of your prophets. And I, am a, as a Gentile, want you to know that I am hanging on. Listen, how I, I, I said, I'm hanging on to this verse, trusting that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one who has said, I can be adopted into his family as a Gentile. And this is proof of it. Have a great Sabbath. No, seriously. I honored his God. His God and my God's the same God, except he's, I'm going the right way and he's going the wrong way. Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father but through me. So watch. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. <laughs> and I will hold your hand. Listen to him. God says, I will keep you. And you know, I could live off of those just four words right there. And give you as a covenant to the people. The word people here is the word Nations. As a light to the Gentiles. You know, why he's, you know why he would send the Jews to be a light to the nations and to the Gentiles? So that the Gentiles and the nations could put their faith in him. Ancient, ancient Hebrew teaching had no problem with a Gentile becoming a believer that's why many times in scripture you read in the Old Testament that when the foreigner comes in among you and accepts my word over and over again, then there's this thing where traditions through, through a modernized or mechanized Judaism robbed the promise of the scriptures and made it all about do's and don'ts and rules and regulations and humanized it. Are you with me? Yeah. That made us the outsiders having no access to eternal life and 
provoked them to not recognize the Messiah when he arrived 2,000 years ago. You see, where are you circumcised? I hope it's in your heart. Because we end here. Finally, look at verse 29. How can you experience this for yourself? Is that you can live with reality. Glory to God. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. Notice your Bible has capital S. That's the Holy Spirit. Not in the, fla- not in the letter. That's the law. Whose praise is not from men, but from God. <laughs> so this is great. We end with this. Watch this. Here's the reality. That God desires to do a work in your life. And many of you would say, he's doing it, he's doing it. Day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Sometimes slow, sometimes faster. Right? And those of us who know this, we, we look at where we're at. And I, having been a Christian for over 40 years, I'm very disgusted with my immaturity as a Christian. You think after 40 years? So this week, preparing for the message, I began beating myself up. And then the Lord reminded me, hey, cheer up. Look where Moses was after 40 years. (laughs) And it's like, that's awesome, God. Thank you. (laughs) It's true, right? I mean, after 40 years, I mean, the guy, you know, he's got an attitude and he murders somebody and throws down tablets and Can you imagine God gives him the Ten Commandments? This is my word. Oh my goodness. And then Moses walks down the mountain and he sees what the people are doing. He's like, what? (laughs) God says, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? (laughs) You know, there's there's revision one and revision two, you know. The first ten, Moses broke. Then God said, all right, all right, I'm going to do this again. Get Get the second set. That's, that's a message, by the way. That's a, that's a message. The law breaks. Can't save. I leave you with this. Let's stand even. This, I've used this verse before. It's so offensive. A Bible verse. It's so offensive to the legal mind. And I'm not talking an attorney. If you're a legalist, you're going to hate this. Okay? If you're a loser like me, saved by the grace of God, you're going to love this. So, the promise, technically, is given to the nation of Israel. Okay, but it's true for all who come to believe in him. It's Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. Any doubt there? No. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. Does that sound amazing? He will rejoice over you with singing. He God will do three things. He will be so glad, speaking in human terms, Jack, I am so glad you're in heaven. Lord, not as glad as I am. (laughs) I don't think I'll say that. I'm just thinking. (laughs) He will quiet me with his love. It's all, listen, Jack. It's all over now. It's all done. You're here. You've kept the faith. You've finished the race. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm looking to him to do that. And I'm doing this because he's patting me until I burp or something. He's, (laughs) He's comforting me, quieting me with his love. And then, and then... He's going to rejoice over me with singing. Can you imagine? Jack, I've been waiting to sing you a song. 
So let me sing you this song. This is, God's going to do this. See, I, I don't know, I don't know. Stop with the doubt. He says so. Enough is enough. Jesus is enough. He died on the cross for our sins. He made all this possible. He rose again from the dead. So Jesus said, you'll never have to die. When your body gives up, when your body's over, death was never spoken about regarding your soul, your spirit. To be absent from the body, the Bible says, is to be present with the Lord.